Here's the book cover of this lovely book. It's a much better book than The Last Days of Old Beijing. So if you like The Last Days of Old Beijing, I can assure you this is much better. Please <laughs> read this one. I didn't know what I was doing with Beijing. Um, briefly, my PowerPoint presentation, by the way, was made on a Mac. And there's only one slide that doesn't translate to a PC. And it's, of course, the map. But that's OK. Chinese say that their country's outline resembles that of a chicken. Um, so this would be the chicken's head. It makes Taiwan the egg. I always think that's interesting. They say that, that the chicken is mothering over Taiwan. It's making sure it's safe and warm. But I'm going to talk today about the Northeast, this head of the chicken, this region uh, north of Beijing over the Great Wall. As Clay alluded to, though, when I first came to China in 1995, 20 years ago this summer, I was sent way down here to Sichuan. And I was uh, group two of the Peace Corps. I was the first Peace Corps volunteer in my site in a town called Leijiang which at the time was the heroin capital of southwest China. It was an interesting place to be for two years because not only was the city changing immeasurably with the drug cleanup, with infrastructure being built, so was the generation of students that I was teaching because I went over there as a 22-year-old. Many of my college-age students were 22, 23. They were trying to figure out how to find a job that wasn't state-appointed, just like I was going to have to find a job that wasn't state-appointed. They were figuring out how to get a driver's license how to find an apartment, all these things that were unknown to generations before them, I was learning alongside of them. So I grew up with that generation of Chinese. The difference now, 20 years later, is that they're all much wealthier than I am. Uh, but after 1997, I moved up to Beijing. Um, and I worked there. I suppose I can use the clicker. So when I moved to Beijing, I originally was teaching at an international school. And I was working as a journalist after a few years. Um, but after a while, I started realizing that it's, you know it's time to write a book when the book you want to read doesn't exist. And all through the late 1990s into the early 2000s, especially after Beijing was selected as the 2008 Summer Olympics host, I wanted to read a book about the changes I was seeing in my neighborhood, in my city, in the places that my wife and I fell in love around, restaurants we frequented, lanes that we would take strolls in, places that we would go on bike rides. And that book didn't exist. I wanted a book that explained why this urban renovation was taking place. Was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? As you know, as Beijing goes in urban planning, so goes the rest of China. So I thought it was important to put a marker down at least and say, OK, here's what I observed of these old lanes that were disappearing. And here's why it matters that they were protected or not. So briefly, I'm going to show you four slides from Beijing before we go to the Northeast. I went online to Cine.com and I started looking for a courtyard home to rent. Um, oftentimes, the courtyard home I wanted to rent, I would show up. The landlord would say, I'm sorry, we got the notice that it's going to be destroyed. Social networks in Beijing run horizontally, though, uh, much like the lanes themselves. It's a horizontal grid, sort of like knots joining a rope. And so if you want a job, if you want a light bulb, if you want a date, if you want to get married, <laughs> You ask somebody who asks somebody who asks somebody, and you get passed down that chain. So I eventually was passed to this house to rent. This is my rooftop that needs weeding here. This is my bike that I used for three years. This is the entrance. I wore those clothes almost every single day. And I moved into this old courtyard home. And I just wanted to sit in one place for two to three years and look at the changes around me and observe and ask myself, again, what was being lost? And was it a good thing or a bad thing? This is the entrance from the lane, and you step in the back. Since the 1950s, when socialist housing policy came into place, housing was not a commodity, but a basic right. Uh, when Beijing became the capital again in the early 1950s, many administrative folks, cadres, came into the city. There was a shortage of housing anyway. So private courtyards such as this, these old suhuyar, were requisitioned, made property of the state. They were often subdivided like this, and people were moved into them. So there's one courtyard here, one courtyard here, one back here, and one back here. This is where I lived. You'd step in, the door was here. You know, in the old days, this was the servant's quarter for this one <laughs> giant courtyard home. It was the, the dampest, darkest back corner, which was where my room was. Important for us right now, there's three people living where this door opens. There's one person living where this door is open. <laughs> there's an elderly woman living here. And where I'm standing, I'm in the room where three more people live. Everybody called me Dadiju. I was big landlord because I had two rooms all to myself. <laughs> this is a propane burner. Uh, this is a cold water tap where we do our laundry and wash our face. But no heat, no air conditioning, uh, no toilet, no running water that was hot at least. But I did have broadband internet, which I think is very 21st century <laughs> China. <laughs> because when the, uh, the city announced it, was, it would host, you know, won the Olympics, but they said, anybody who wants internet can have it. And I said, I'm going to try them on this. 
And they actually came out and ran the wire over the roof and dropped it down into my room, which was great. The worst part about living here was easily the toilet. Uh, my toilet was right down the lane. It was a good four minute walk. There was no dividers for when I would go in and squat down. I'd often be squatting next to my elementary age students who would yell, good morning, teacher Plum Blossom, because that's my name. My Chinese name I wrote here is Mei Dong, Heroic Eastern Plum Blossom. It's a terrible Chinese name, but I was known as teacher Plum Blossom, and in some circles I still am. Up until, you know, as the, the city was ramping up for the Olympics, advertising began permeating every corner of Beijing life to the point where I, when I would walk into my toilet and would squat down, I'd be facing this guy. <laughs> and, and he would, he, I love this by the way, Chinese is such a beautifully direct language and it's fun to report in Chinese actually because people are quite frank that they had to change their name to the proctology hospital before the Olympics. Uh, but 2005, 2006, 2007, they were still the anus and intestine disease hospital. He's telling you all the symptoms you could be checking yourself for while you're squatting there. I really want to know who this agent is for this guy. He got this gig. This is the last picture I'll show you from Beijing, and I wanted to illustrate a couple of things. One is the density of this neighborhood where I was living. Da Shilar, this is on the southwest corner of Tiananmen Square, in, officially in Mandarin. It's Da Jalan, big fence, because um, these lanes were often gated at night during the Qing Dynasty to keep thieves out. It was the Chinatown during Qing Dynasty, essentially, that the Manchu um, rulers, people from the Northeast, when they ruled all of China and Beijing was their capital, the imperial city was just north of here, just behind these apartment buildings. There was a canal that ran here, and many Han Chinese in Beijing at that time, especially the merchants, were pushed into this quarter, which was outside the imperial city. So when you think of Peking acrobats, Peking opera, Peking duck, a lot of that culture flourished in these lanes. Now, because the city was outside of imperial planning codes, it's not a perfect grid of Hutong. It was one square mile, but it had 110 lanes in it. Often they would dead end. Some of them are quite narrow, no wider than you know, a square on this carpet. Uh, it was incredibly difficult to do reporting here because I was dealing not only with this non-standard uh, planning uh, footprint, I was also dealing with a vast population. So Vatican City is one square mile and has 700 people in it. Dashilar, this neighborhood, is one square mile and has 57,000 people living in it, larger than my hometown in Minnesota even. So um, people, I thought when I moved into Beijing, I was writing one sort of book, but it turned out that I was writing a different book. When I moved into the neighborhood, I thought I was writing a book about the loss of architectural heritage and the importance of architectural heritage and what the memory of a city means, especially as connected to its buildings. I quickly learned, however, that the people who live in this neighborhood did not have attachments to their homes. They didn't so much care that the houses were 300 years old. They cared about these people. They cared about their neighbors. They cared about the role they played in the neighborhood. They cared that when they walked down on the street in the morning, people knew them by name. And this matches what Jane Jacobs has written you know, about New York City and the death and life of great American cities, or Herbert Gans has written about social policy and urban planning in Boston in the 50s and 60s. Most people on the lane knew one another. Uh, an urban planner walked down this with me and she said, you know, everything you need except for open heart surgery is within a five minute walk of your door. And that's another thing that especially the elderly in this neighborhood were so attached to is the services that could be rendered there. And that it, they were living in a closed economy. If you gave your yuan to somebody for water, that person would use that yuan, yuan to give to somebody else for noodles. The noodle person would take it and go to the grocery store and buy something. You could almost follow the money circulating around in this economy. Two more things about this neighborhood. One thing that surprised me is that these neighborhoods function um, in the making of more Beijingers. So about half the population is so-called native, you know, Bundi Ren to Beijing. About half are Waidi Ren from outside, migrants who have come in. And I looked back at historical censuses of the neighborhood, and even found like dating back to the 20s and 30s and before that, the population was about the same. Half native to Beijing, half migrants who had come in to find work. And you would see these migrants change very rapidly over a period of a year of two years. Their regional accent would become the Beijing accent. Um, they were proud to pay Beijing taxes because they were making enough for their business. And they were most of all proud that their children could go to elementary school in Beijing. And this is the last point I want to make about this before we go to Manchuria. These kids right here are grade four. They're wearing the state-issued Anchuan, the safety hat. They're wearing their young pioneer red kerchiefs. They're wearing their school uniforms, grade four. These girls are grade six. And I taught these girls grade four, grade five, grade six. The local elementary school let me in. 
and I was able to volunteer every day as an English teacher and teach the same group of kids, grade four, grade five, grade six, and follow them. Why aren't the girls in grade six wearing the school uniform? Does anybody know? These girls are the children of migrants. In Beijing right now and in Chinese cities, we often hear that, oh, China has officially urbanized. More people live in cities than they do in the countryside. Officially, that's true. But a vast majority of these newcomers to cities really live as second-class citizens, and they're living on borrowed time. Their registration permits, their papers, their hukou, are still in their hometowns in the countryside. What that means is, um, say you're elderly, you won't get the same access to state-provided health care, for example. But if you're a kid, it means that you cannot sit for the middle school entrance exam in Beijing. So of my students I was teaching, grade four, grade five, grade six, I'd say half of them sat for the Beijing middle school entrance exam. They went on to middle school in Beijing. About half were the children of migrants to this neighborhood, and they had to go back to the countryside and sit for the exam there, which got me thinking, what is going on in the countryside? And so I moved from this environment to this. <laughs> I know, right? Can you imagine just the sigh of relief I had, by the way, when I went from this to ah, space? and sky, and non-pollution, and this famous northeastern Heitudi, the black soil, you know, that's so rich that it's almost like spent coffee grounds when you put it in your hand. Incredibly fertile. So I am in an area that's historically known as Manchuria. Today, Chinese usually say Dongbei, the northeast. And we're going up here now. This is Beijing. This is the Great Wall. I'd follow that line about right there. The Great Wall is historically the de facto border into the northeast. Today, it's Heilongjiang, Jilin, and Liaoning province. You see Lushun and Dalian at the coast here. This is a warm water port on the Yellow Sea. Large part of this border um, is with North Korea, which has, uh, Korea's had a large influence on Manchuria over the years, including Korean farmers were the first ones to plant rice in the Northeast, which is tied into my village and what I was doing there. Here's Vladivostok, and then all of Siberia, and then Mongolia. And another thing, I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit, you know, the, the Russians in the, the turn of the 20th century built the Trans-Siberian Railroad from Moscow to Vladivostok, and they cut across Heilongjiang here, the way the Canadian Railroad once went from Montreal to Halifax over the top of Maine. It went through US territory. Same idea. And so the Russians had a large influence on this area. So did Korea, so did the Japanese, as I'll get to in a minute. You see the Sea of Japan here. My original idea when I came up here was that Oh, I wanted to do a different book than Beijing. I didn't want to repeat the same structure of living in a village, teaching at a school, observing monumental change. I wanted to do something quite different. It didn't turn out that way, unfortunately. So this village is called Wasteland. It's 600 miles northeast from Beijing. That's the same distance as if you were going from Washington, D.C. to Maine by train. Just picture going straight to the northeast. It's different than most Chinese farming villages in that it's relatively prosperous. The average Chinese farmer makes about $1,500 a year. In Wasteland, they make closer to $2,200 to $2,300 a year, 50% more than your average farmer. You see this is the new school building here, accordion gate, new basketball court. I like that the kids are out playing basketball. They pounded the snow down to make it playable. Um, but the reason I chose this village is my wife grew up here, and her mom grew up here. And in the Beijing book, I was a stranger. I was coming into a neighborhood and always identifying myself as teacher plum blossom and getting to know people and working hard for that information. I had a theory that it would be easier to go to a village where I had family and was known. That turned out to be completely wrong. It's much harder to write about family than it is about strangers because family want to fact check you on a daily basis, <laughs> if not hourly basis. What are you saying about me? Um, and people have resentments in villages too. I wasn't aware of this. In, in Beijing, there's so much going on. There's so much in and out of transfer of population that it's easy to follow people and then they drop out of the narrative for a while and they come back in. But in a village like Wasteland, it's 20 square miles. It's 1,500 people, 500 men, 500 women, 500 children. Notice the correlation there. Um, and they knew each other. They knew each other intimately. And they, they had grudges and resentments that went back generations. So that was a challenge in writing about this place as well. Now the school my wife went to, that building is down here. That's now a coal shed. They have a brand new school building here. But I found when I got there that there wasn't a lot for me to do. No farmer was going to let me into their field to work their rice paddy because it was their life, lifeblood. So um, I am a licensed teacher, and so I again ended up at the elementary school teaching uh, children over a period of years. I also wanted to sort of replicate what Pearl Buck did before she wrote The Good Earth. 
Pearl Buck's husband, John Losing Buck, founded the first agricultural economics department in China. He and Pearl in the 1920s would go out into the provinces, especially Anhui province, and they would go out and do these massive farm surveys where John would go out into the fields and look at farm implements, at credit, at seed selection, at crop rotation. But Pearl would sit in the house with the women and she'd ask the women, what songs do you sing to your babies? What food do you cook at night? Do you know any good jokes? And Pearl recorded all this lore. And when you look at John Losing Bucks, these massive surveys, he was the better known writer for a while before Pearl was. <laughs> They're these boring statistical tables. But in between are often these lovely adages, aphorisms, jokes, recipes that Pearl had collected sitting in the homes with the women and had added to the manuscript. <coughs> John didn't thank Pearl Buck for her work. He only thanked her for the typing in the acknowledgments and she divorced him soon after. So there's a word to the wise there. Credit your wife for the work she does or spouse. And then she went and wrote The Good Earth in five months time. So I started along the same track. I thought I'm going to go around the village and try to collect as many stories as I can just from people who are living here to show how different this region is from other places. And one of these people is Mr. Mung who's a lumberjack on the Red Flag Logging Commune. And Mr. Meng has great fame in China now because he's the first and only Chinese to be abducted by aliens. <laughs> and to me, this is very, you know, I, I grew up in rural Minnesota, and Minnesotans are a little touched in the head because they're a little, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere a lot of the time, especially in deep, cold winter. And Mr. Meng reminded me a lot of this. He said one night he saw a flash of light on Phoenix Mountain here. He was in bed. He <laughs> found himself levitating, passed through the wall of his house, was taken to the spaceship. I said, oh my gosh, what, what happened next? He said, then I made love to one of the aliens. I said, come on. I said, did you tell your wife? He said, no, but I told the media. So that was brilliant. <laughs> he became renowned throughout China to the point where tourists started visiting him and bringing him, like Japanese tourists brought, um, excuse me, brought a, brought a television for him. Sorry about that. Speaking of family, that's my family calling me. Um, brought a television for him. A Malaysian businessman brought him a cow. He said, what am I gonna do with a cow all the way out here? But he ended up, um, this story got, went viral at the time in China, and he used the story to propel his family off this defunct logging commune. He ended up getting offered a job in a Harbin University running the steam plant there. He got his son in an affiliated university elementary school. And so for me, I saw Mr. Meng as this wonderful example of Northeastern self-invention. Because pioneers have been coming to this area for the last 400 years and have largely had to reinvent themselves or make something out of this land because they were fleeing famines in southern China, because they were sent there to repel Russians that were moving into the area, whatever the reason, self-invention. Now my wife, who's from this area, just saw him as a great example of the northeastern art of bullshitting, but <laughs> you can decide for yourself. I mentioned rice. Um, the area, this is the farm I focused on. This is my relative's farm. The average Chinese farm plot for a family is about an acre and a half, about the same size as an American football field. In America today, for a, a crop farm to be economically viable, it needs to be about two to 3,000 acres. Not so in China. And also, you know, different between America and China. In America, in 1992, the U.S. Census stopped counting farmers because farmers had become statistically insignificant in America. Less than 9% of farms grow the vast majority of our food. Not so in China. This is an acre and a half. Here it is in wintertime. Here it is with a thaw right around now, late March. See that hay to di, that black soil. Here it is as the rice is coming in. Notice this is flat patties. It's irrigated with canals they've dug, and the Songhua River isn't far from here. Here it is with the, when the rice has come into ear. And here it is at harvest time. And when I first moved there, harvesting was largely still being done by hand. That changed quite rapidly in the period I was there. Um, but you see this land here, this is, village is called Wasteland, but to me it looks a lot like Sonoma County. It doesn't look a lot like a wasteland. You know, it's this flat, fertile floodplain that's going out to these foothills, and these foothills stretch out to North Korea. This is the house I moved into. I'm sharing this with a gentleman named Mr. Guan. He's an ethnic Manchu who still had ties to a family farm plot of rice. And like many farmers in China, he's using his yard as a secondary source of income. Here's his onions, corn, grape trellis. Our outhouse is back here. I didn't have to make a, a walk this time. And there was no advertising in our outhouse, which is good. Lots of rats, though. This is my half of the house right here. I should say, by the way, that my wife had no interest in coming back to the village to live with me when I was doing this research. She came back the first week and said, ugh, I've reverted to being an eight-year-old Chinese girl. 
everybody in the village treats me like I'm a baby again. They don't, they're not interested in my law job. They're not interested in my studies abroad. So she left and went to Hong Kong uh, to resume her law career while I was up here largely by myself. Now my house, when you walk inside, you see this. Here's the door. Here's a little part of the, the cement here. And then you step up onto what's known as a Kong, the brick bed that's endemic to the Northeast. This is uh, all brick. It stretches the entire length of my house. And you can see some burn marks here. On the outside of the window here is a vent into which you stuff dried rice chaff. So in wintertime, the farmers pile up this rice chaff next to their house, taller than the roof line. And in wintertime, you use it to heat your home. The average temperature in winter is about minus 18 Fahrenheit. But you'd be sitting on this in shorts and a t-shirt because you're so warm. In fact, after a while, you start to smell like baked bread. You start to feel like you're, you're rising as well. You know, This is my corn growing here. I really liked this part of it, though. When I came home at night, I felt like I was stepping up on stage. Right? So I'd sit down and do, dump my notes out and be writing, and I felt like I was sort of performing when I was at home. When I first moved to Wasteland, there was only one road, Red Flag Road. It was uh, one lane, and it was lined with these Manchurian elm trees. But in my first summer, I started hearing loud noises, um, and the road was <laughs> ended up being doubled in width hand, by hand. The trucks would come and dump the rocks here, and these guys, these imported laborers, would come from other areas and break the stone by hand and widen the road. One of the main characters in the book is Auntie Yi, and she did not like this project one bit. Auntie Yi grew up in this region. She remembers going to school during the Japanese occupation. She can sing the Manchukuoan national anthem in Japanese still. Um, after liberation in the 1950s, she ended up interning as a government cadre and became a full-fledged party member. And from the 1960s until her retirement, she was in village government. She does not like this road project, not because um, she doesn't want a wider road, although she didn't like the fact that they dug up her flowers here and put in this strip of lawn. She thought the lawn was silly. And they came and buttered her house in yellow so it would look better when officials came to visit. She didn't like that. What she really was upset about were these street lights, for example, solar-powered street lights, which I liked, but she didn't like the fact that they had advertisements on them. And the advertisements were for the company that built this road, Eastern Fortune Rice. So a major change happened the first summer I got to this village. And you know, in nonfiction, you're always sort of there but for the grace of God go the anyway. You, know, you can only write what you're seeing in front of you and what happens. But my book idea of school kids and lore and alien lovers um, was quickly subsumed by this notion of wasteland, this village, becoming, in essence, a company town. This is what happened um, out the, my back door. You see the traditional Manchu corn drying in winter here. These cranes were rising, and by summertime, that became this. Yeah, right? So if you're an elderly Chinese person in a village like this, you don't want to move into these apartments because you believe in jie di qi. You believe in touching the Earth's energy with your foot on the ground, or you don't want to lose your garden or your chicken coop and these things you have around it. But what started happening in Wasteland that first summer I got there is this company, Eastern Fortune Rice, was sort of a model business for the national government because they said, look, farmers, we have a serious problem here. The average Chinese farmer is about 68 years old, right? such as Sanjo. He's another character in the book, a man who's been farming in Wasteland his entire life. And he's somebody I follow throughout the years as well. Most children do not set foot in the paddy. Right? And in Wasteland, there's no equivalent of a 4-H club. There's no equivalent of, say, the Minnesota State Fair, you know, where people would go in and show their prized rice. Instead, your average farmer was like Sanjo, elderly, had done it his entire life. So China, on the one hand, is facing this labor shortage of young people that don't want to work on the farms. Their family says, we worked on the farm, so you don't have to. You go to school. There's one pressure Chinese agriculture is facing. Another pressure agriculture is facing is urbanization. An uh, area of farm the size of the state of New York has been plowed under and made into city now. Right? So they've lost that much, <laughs> that much land area that was being used for farming. Another issue is food safety. An area the size of the state of Maryland was recently declared contaminated and could no longer be used to be planting crops. Another thing is if everybody in this room grew one acre of rice and then we all shoveled it into a bin here, if I'm a food safety official, I'll have no way of knowing how much fertilizer you put on your rice, how much herbicide you put on your rice, what your soil is like in your neck of the village. And so another reason that China wants businesses to take over farming is because it's a way of improving food safety. It's also a way of increasing production levels because if you're mechanizing your farming, um, you have a much higher efficiency rate of what you're producing. 
Sanjo didn't like this at all. He said, look, I've lived here since the 50s. I was here for the communes. I was here for the Cultural Revolution. I was here with the famine before that. I was here when the household contract responsibility system came in and we could finally have our own plots. I was here when the government abolished all taxes on Chinese farmers in 2006. And I'm here now when farmers have a 30-year lease on their farm plot. They have the rights for 30 years to farm that piece of land. He doesn't like the fact that companies like Eastern Fortune Rice are coming in and pressuring farmers to sign documents saying, go ahead and farm my land for three-year contracted period. The company's po point of view is, look, you don't want to farm it anyway. We'll give you a new apartment. We'll knock down your house. We'll plant rice here so we'll increase overall acreage. We'll give you a guaranteed price that's higher than your annual income right now. So the average farmer in Wasteland makes about $2,300 a year. Eastern Fortune Rice promises them $2,500 a year. Three years fixed, guaranteed money. Go in the city, do something else, whatever you want, but that money is guaranteed. But Sanjo says, no, the price of rice has doubled in the last six years. The price of rice is going to keep going up. In Wasteland, we largely grow organically. Our rice is expensive. It's that short grain sticky variety that we eat in sushi, um, and there's a high demand for it. So he does not want to sign his land rights over to the company. However, um, this model is supported by the national government. And usually when you go to a Chinese village, if you see a poster or a picture of a Chinese leader, this is then President Hu Jintao, who visited in 2007, that leader will be in Wellingtons and a Mao suit and out in the muck with the farmers to show solidarity with these people. Hu Jintao didn't do that when he visited in 2007. He instead wore his suit. He's visiting here at the manager of Eastern Fortune Rice. This is at Eastern Fortune Rice's headquarters. And Hu Jintao gave his imprimatur to this experiment saying, this is a fantastic model that China should be following. Now, Wasteland's a little bit different because the, the agribusiness here is local. Eastern Fortune Rice was founded by the poorest family in the village in 2000, um, and at least is local. But in other principalities, such as in Anhui province, Cargill, the American agribusiness giant, has a poultry operation it started that processes 65 million birds a year. The government likes it because Cargill has uniform antibiotics they give the chickens, the area is sealed, they can control production, but local poultry farmers might not feel the same. By my second summer, this billboard went up. It says, build the first village of the Northeast. And here's the name of the village, Da Huang Di, Da Huang Di Cun, Huang Di Cun, Wasteland. Um, again, you started seeing more and more stories in the national press about Wasteland and the changes that were happening here. And just last year, next to Wasteland, not far from here, um, a Singapore consortium broke ground on a 500 square mile super farm, what they're calling it. 500 square miles is the same area as that of metropolitan Los Angeles. So this trend is accelerating in China. I should say one thing about Wasteland, the name. It looks nothing like a Wasteland, right? And that in this village over here, this is called Mudtown. This is called the Dunes. There's a village over here named Lonely Outpost. And there's a village over here named Zhang Smelly Ditch, which I think is awesome. And I would ask people, you know, what's the history of this village? We could date it back to 1722 when the village was actually founded. No one could say for sure why these places have these horrible names, except for the notion that they didn't want other migrants stopping here. Right? They wanted people to pass by. They didn't want them to take this good land <coughs> or for bandits to stop here. I'm going to shift a little bit now and show you a few photos um, that evince how this area is so different than the rest of China and why maybe this experimental agricultural reform um, is taking foot in the Northeast. I think one of the reasons is that the Northeast has long been a region of experimentation. It's not Han Chinese ethnically, or it wasn't, it is now, but historically it was an area outside the pale, beyond the Great Wall. Often Chinese would call it the land beyond the pale or um, the Great Northern Wasteland. In Caddyshack, Rodney Dangerfield says that he bought some land at the Great Wall on the good side, but wastelands on the, the Northeast is on the other side of that wall, right? So it dates back to, and you, we're in China, and you go to imperial sites or historical sites, they're often gated, and you have to buy an entrance ticket, um, and there's somebody selling socks out front. Um, but it's not like that when you visit a lot of these sites that are not ethnically Han Chinese historical sites in the Northeast. And that goes back to the Jin Dynasty. This was the Jurchen people that come from this region, came down over the Great Wall, started a dynasty in the early 12th century. If you've been to Beijing, you can picture the Central Lakes. Those were um, started under the Jin. But look at this sign. This is posting uh, the way to this site. And you go out there, and this is all you find. You know, there's no rebuilt palaces, there's no signs even explaining where you are, just this marker there. 
in a nearby town, I did finally find a statue of the Jurchen leader here, Wanyan Aguda, but that's it. Again, no narrative, no postcards, no souvenir stands. We'll fast forward in history a little bit to Nur Hatsa. This was a gentleman that united uh, the Jurchen and other northeastern tribes into what came to be called the Manchu. Again, there's debate about why the, where the name Manchu comes from. His son um, declared that the people were now called the Manchu. The land they come from is the land of the Manchu. It probably means intrepid arrow, this notion, or it could mean gentle wisdom after a, a Buddhist bodhisattva that the Jurchen and then Manchu worshipped. Uh, under his leadership, he was killed in battle, but then under his son, um, in the 16, early 1600s, the Manchu swept over the Great Wall, conquered Beijing, and took over all of China. In the beginning of this talk, I showed you that map of China that resembles the outline of a chicken. Many of those territories were added during the Manchu reign. So what we think of as contemporary China today, with the west of Tibet and Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia and the Northeast and even Taiwan, those areas all came in um, under the Manchu rule. One thing I think is interesting, though, about the Northeast today is you seldom see Manchu. And, and when you do, um, it, there's, there's two types of Manchu I found. There's Manchu who are self-identifying now and saying, I'm Manchu. I don't want to be classified as Han Chinese anymore. I'm proud of my history. But really, for the last hundred years, Manchu have sort of been shunted off to the side. Chinese has, or China has 15 different kinds of autonomous counties for ethnicities. The Manchu were the last to get their own uh, autonomous county. And maybe this is because they were being punished for the Qing dynasty. Maybe it's because they had so cynified themselves into contemporary China that they didn't need an autonomous county. Because many Manchu can't speak Manchu at all, let alone read it. In fact, in my book, I, I travel to the last village in Manchuria where there's native Manchu speakers. Half of the world's languages are going to go extinct this century. None were once as prominent as Manchu. In this village today, there are three native speakers left. They're all in their late 80s. Talking to them was very difficult because the government does not want them giving interviews. However, at the elementary school, I did see this. This is the Manchu script. See, it's quite different than Chinese. It's a Mongolian-based script. And underneath it, it says, passing on Manchu culture begins with me. But that was odd. Well, there's a teacher in this village, age 40 years old, who's teaching children Manchu. He was trying to do it at school, but he came under a lot of political pressure because in China, the language of instruction has to be Mandarin, and if you learn a foreign language, it has to be English. It can't be Manchu or Tibetan, right? But he was taught the language by his grandmother, and he says it's his duty to try to pass this on. But the Manchu have all but gone um, extinct culturally in the Northeast. Today, the Northeast is about the size of Germany and France combined geographically, and population, the same 110 million people. Only about 10% of them are ethnically Manchu. There were attempts throughout the Manchu reign of China to keep people from entering the Northeast. They wanted to try to preserve the Northeast as their, as their homeland. But because of famine in the South and because of Russian incursions from the North, there was this fluctuating policy of needing to let Han Chinese from the South into the Northeast and then trying to repel them as well. Sometimes people would be exiled up here. Sometimes traders would be coming and going. Sometimes pioneer farmers would be sent here to keep the Russians from settling the region. One of the attempts, an early attempt that failed, um, was something called the Willow Palisade. And this was a structure that was the size, if you think of Maine again, if you think of the state of Maine, this, this fence, this lesser great wall, blocked off an area the size of the state of Maine that no Han Chinese could enter. The Manchu wanted this to be their homeland. And it was interesting to me because Wasteland was within this palisade, but nobody in Wasteland, including my Manchu neighbor, um, knew what it was. And in school, they were never taught it. And my wife was never taught it either. She had to learn about the Great Wall and other Han Chinese markers of history, not Manchu-built ones. This is the remains of the palisade that I finally found up by the border with Mongolia. There was a moat here. This is the berm that wild sunflowers are growing on now. And then on top of this mound of earth, there was a series of willow trees that were knotted together with rope. And that was the border. And it had checkpoints and everything else like the Great Wall did. Today, all that I could find that remains of it is this old marker that these farmers, who are all ethnically Manchu, are, are having fun stepping on. But they didn't know where, what I was looking for either. I kept saying, I'm looking for Leo Taobian, the Willow Palace thing. And they'd be like, the what? The what? How's Obama doing? You know, they wanted to hear more about that <laughs> than about this, this, this culture. Which is true, though, as an outsider, right? When you come into foreign cultures, you often have more interest in the culture than the people who live there, because to them, it's not culture, it's just home, right? 
there's no difference. I'll fast forward a bit now to the, the 20th century. I mentioned earlier that the Russians built a railroad across the Northeast, and you do see markers of Russian occupation and Russian attempts to bend Manchuria to their will as well. So the Manchu failed. They left, they retreated from the region. They couldn't keep Han Chinese from moving in. The Manchu dynasty fell. The last emperor abdicated. And around that same time, the Russians were coming into the Northeast with this railroad they built. Um, this is St. Sophia Orthodox Cathedral, which is a remains in Harbin. After a while, I realized that traveling in the Northeast was sort of like going across a board game called Empire. And you're just seeing these playing pieces that have been left behind that people who had tried to shape it. One thing I think is interesting about this site, when I visited Harbin for the first time in the late 1990s, you couldn't see this building from the street. All throughout the communist times, um, it was blocked off by apartment buildings on all sides, it was boarded up, and it was actually used as a warehouse for a department store. In the late 1990s, Manchuria was among the hardest hit of economic reforms. State-owned enterprises closed. Cities were especially hit because manufacturing bases were being stripped down. A lot of Manchurian cities turned to tourism to raise revenue. And so unlike other cities in China that have plowed under their colonial architecture or even their historic architecture for that matter, you see more of it in the Northeast, including buildings such as this. At this point in history, Harbin was home to 53 nationalities speaking 45 languages. It was the crossroads of Asia at that time, and certainly the most multinational um, place in China. You still see these old Russian railway stations. I love that you know, the brighter the walls, the more desolate the surroundings. It was like urging you, please get off the train here. But these aren't used anymore, which I think is interesting, but they're still marked, and they're marked as patriotic education bases. There's a plaque here. So now they're used as school groups you know, will come and see, here's what the Russians built, the colonists built in our land. Going forward a little bit here, this is on the border with Manjoli. Up by Siberia, you see this old Russian-built water tower next to this Soviet-built uh, apartment block. In 1905, Japan enters the picture. Japan defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War, and they started building their permanent markers, or what they thought were going to be their permanent markers in the region. This is in Lushun, also called Port Arthur. This is the museum, which I just find a fascinating piece of architecture. You have this pea gravel here, and these, it's almost like a Habsburg palace. And in the book, I interview the curator of this museum who protected it during the Cultural Revolution. I said, how in the world did you keep Red Guards from ransacking this place? And he said, it's, Joe and Lai did not call. It was not a Joe and Lai phone call. You often hear that joke. Instead, he said he boarded up all the windows, painted red slogans on the outside, and he said he, he put all the valuable artifacts in the basement, but he kept a little reserve of, of sort of less valuable artifacts up top. So when the Red Guards would come and knock on the door, he would hand them like that vase, or that plate, or that urn, and they'd make a, make a big show of smashing it, and then he'd be like, okay, they left, you know. So they still have this beautiful collection here because Japan tried to show itself as a civilizing influence, and it sort of made a greatest hits of Chinese culture collection here, including oracle bones, including uh, bronzes, including Tang ceramics, and so forth. You can also still stay in the hotels that Japan built along its South Manchuria Railway. The Northeast had the first extensive railway network in China. Russians built most of it and administered it after the war Japan took over. The South Manchuria Railway became the largest corporation in Japan. One quarter of Japanese tax revenue was coming from this railroad network, including from things like tourism. They built these beautiful old hotels, many of which still stand today. Some are, have been lovingly refurbished, and you can stay in them. Some of them, like this one, now look like this. I like, by the way, that um, in this picture, the road's being built 100 years ago, and then 100 years later, it's still being built. <laughs> it's a very Chinese picture, you know, <laughs> time lapse. You can see the archway here on the door, and that's kind of about it that still remains. Some of these windows up top, you know. The reason I was drawn to this hotel is this was where Puyi, the last emperor of China, was hidden by Japanese forces that were trying to convince him to come and take over as nominal head of Manchukuo, the puppet state. When you walk into the building here, you go up this old, creaking, wooden staircase, just like Puyi describes in his diary, and you can see the actual room that he was held in. It's not marked as a historic site, though. There's no plaque outside of it. So this is different than the rest of China, too, in that when you're hunting for these historical sites, you can find them. They haven't been torn down. You also see things like this. This is in, in Changchun, which was the capital of Manchukuo, the Japanese puppet state, old Shinto war shrine with the Japanese pines out front. I asked the city official, why hasn't this been torn down? And he said, well, people really like to roller skate here. 
So that was a, and there they are, rollerblading now. I thought that was a great pragmatic answer though, like, yeah, we'll get around to it eventually was his point, but it's still standing now. And you still see things like this. This is in Changchun. This was the state council building of Manchukuo. And the Japanese who built these colonial administrative buildings called this architectural style Rising Asia. You know, they really thought that Manchukuo was going to be a civilizing influence in the region and would modernize in ways that Japan even hadn't modernized. This is where Pui's office was, apparently. Now it's been repurposed as a hospital administration building. Pui, I travel his uh, routes quite a bit throughout the book because he's this very sad figure. You know, he was enthroned as an infant, if you've seen the last Emperor movie, um, abdicated tried to get into the British legation, hoping that as a boy he could be go, you know, sent to Oxford and live his life out as an intellectual. The British said, we won't let you in. The Japanese legation took him in in Beijing, and the Japanese really took over his life after that point, and again, put him on the throne in Manchukuo. You can visit his former palace in, in Changchun. Everything with Puyi is now called, like, he's the puppet emperor. So this is the puppet emperor's palace, and when you go inside, you see a puppet Puyi. Here he is talking to a Japanese general with his picture here. Again, a patriotic education base. He's, he's, you know, Pui is largely labeled a traitor in contemporary Chinese history. His, his personal story is more complicated than that, I think. <laughs> a brief word about Manchukuo, because again, the word Manchuria for many Chinese has echoes of this puppet state. Um, this is the Manchukuo flag. This is the Japanese flag. This is the Vichy Republic of China flag. There's propaganda, again, saying these three nations nominal nations would come together under one. I know all of this history. I think a lot of you know this history, and we know why Japanese-Chinese tensions remain high because of this wartime history. But what I didn't know until I moved to Manchukuo was how different the Northeast experience in the war was from the rest of China. I know most of you know about the rape of Nanking, bombing of Chongqing, and southern cities. What I didn't know until I lived here and started interviewing people was how many Japanese farmers were shipped to the Northeast to start satellite towns. You see, the, this is a propaganda poster saying, to Manchuria, and they have their Japanese flag here. The Japanese farm economy was largely failing in the 1930s, and so the government and the military had an idea, say, we're going to ship Japanese farmers from villages and put them in the Northeast, but we won't take the firstborn daughter or son. We only want secondborn son, secondborn daughter to go over to Manchuria, and we'll rename the settlements with the same name as their village in Japan. It'll be a mirror society, essentially. The Japanese farmers thought they were going and getting 25 acres, a hoe, a mule, um, and, and un, unfarmed land that they would open up, right, and farm themselves and make their own. The reality was, is when they got there, they were often occupying land that had been forcibly taken from Chinese and Manchurian farmers, and the farmers were often given single bolt action rifles and were put out in the farthest reaches of the Northeast along the border <laughs> that the Soviet army was likely going to cross when it finished fighting Hitler in its west. This is where the history gets a little more complicated and where I, uh, I really enjoyed researching this part. There were 270,000 of these farmers in Manchuria in 1945 when the Soviet army started invading the region. The Japanese military basically turned tail and fled. A lot of the men farmers had been promised that they would not be drafted, but as the war kept getting worse and worse, they were called up. So it left mostly women and children in these rural areas. This is a site in Fangzheng. This is a, a county about three hours downriver from Harbin. And on this dock, you see the river here, the Songhua is really, it's deep, it's wide, it's quite malevolent here. The current is really strong. On this dock is where thousands of Japanese women um, it, not just on the dock, but in the neighboring village, waited for what they told were rescue ships that were going to come and get them. These ships never came. The women ended up putting their children on the dock here or in the village and stepping into the current. The children, however, were adopted by local farmers. And so it's an interesting area to visit today and sort of symbolic of what I think this ongoing narrative of the war and this contested narrative of the war, because in these villages, you still see street signs in Chinese and Japanese. The foreign language schools are not English foreign language schools. They're Japanese foreign language schools. You still have elderly um, orphans from this village being repatriated back to Japan. You still have Japanese um, descendants coming from Japan during the grave sweeping festival to clean their grave in August. And so a lot of the residents of this, this area say, like, we're seen as traitors to the Chinese narrative, right? When in fact, we're also victims of this war just as much as the Japanese civilians were victims of Japanese imperialism. There's a local historian who's trying to get this sign posted and marked as a patriotic education base. Um, he's had no luck whatsoever. 
There is a cemetery in this village that Zhou Enlai dedicated in the early 1960s that actually survived the Cultural Revolution, because it's so far out in the middle of nowhere, in which the remains of Japanese settlers are buried. Now there's the internet in China, though. And when a new memorial was erected at this cemetery two years ago for 500 more bodies that had been found, Japanese farmers, Chinese nationalists from the south got on a train, came up here with hammers and spray paint to face the memorial. The next day, the Fuhrer had reached a point where bulldozers came and they bulldozed the memorial and they closed the cemetery now to visitors. So again, you have this contested narrative of was Japan good, was Japan bad, or in this region, weren't we all victims of this war um, and shouldn't we see it from that point of view? It's obvious, you know, I think you know if you know anything about the, the wartime history in, in China, especially the Northeast, why Chinese who aren't in the Northeast would harbor such hatred towards the occupation and the invasion. This is a picture of the 731 uh, medical research base where Chi Japan's version of Joseph Mengele did gruesome experiments on live prisoners of war and 3,000 POWs were killed here with chemical or other types of weapons. It's a bit discerning to go, uh, disconcerting to go here now because you're looking at bone saws and other things displayed. But right over the wall is a middle school where kids are playing outside and laughing, you know, which is kind of nice actually. But the, the doctor who ran that camp was not persecuted and the US Army gave him immunity in exchange for his research findings. And that was not brought to light until the late <coughs> 1970s. A couple more slides here about wartime. Um, another narrative that's still being contested is that of the Japanese prisoner of war camps in the region. The survivors of the Bataan Death March, the general who surrendered Singapore, the general who surrendered the Philippines, were brought to the Northeast and put in this camp. There's been an attempt here to open a museum for the past decade, but the fight is ongoing about how to portray the history here. Who were the victims of this camp? What was the Chinese role in it? Were the Chinese helpful? Were the Chinese not helpful? Were the Japanese all evil? How come the Red Cross was allowed to visit? You get in all these sort of contested narratives. And this is being led by um, veterans of the camp, including the camp's liberator. This is Staff Sergeant Harold Leith. He passed away last year, unfortunately, but I interviewed him in his home before he did. As a young um, OSS agent, he parachuted out of an airplane with only a pistol and landed amongst 30,000 Japanese soldiers and had to convince them the war was over and he had to liberate this camp, right? And he really didn't like the way the narrative was being portrayed um, at the POW camp with the Chinese as liberators. And he said, in fact, it was his team that, that risked their necks to get in there. You know, moving forward, just a few more slides here about the history is the Korean War is another ongoing um, conflicted narrative in the region. This is China. This is North Korea. MacArthur was ordered he could only bomb the North Korean side of the river, couldn't enter Chinese territory. Chairman Mao said, that's fine. We'll have our fighter pilots take off and attack your planes as you're doing that. So you can't chase us over our airspace. So over a six day battle, this bridge, this is Dandong in China today. This is Sinyujiu in North Korea. Over a six-day battle, the American forces took out the Korean half of the bridge, but left the, um, the Chinese side untouched. Today, when you visit this site, you know, there's these old, these old supports here leading a dotted line to North Korea. I like the Ferris wheel over here. It's a big tourist site. And from Wasteland, from the village I was, um, a 16-year-old, a then 16-year-old soldier told me his account of being at this battle. And when he said, you know, it's funny, when you look at the sign, how it's marked, it only says, the Americans bombed the bridge from November 8th to November 14th, 1950. It tells nothing of the larger story of the masses, 130,000 Chinese troops that were massing on this side of the border that knew, although the Americans were taking up 600 sorties to take out this bridge, that the river was about to freeze. <laughs> so after six days of bombing, of finally dropping that half of the bridge, the Chinese simply just walked across the frozen river and entered the war. And MacArthur had to resign or was sacked, depending on how you look at that, uh, not many months later. A brief word about Chairman Mao. You do still see Mao invoked in the Northeast, but it's mostly in the cities, not in the countryside. Any nostalgia I heard from Mao or Maoism or communist planned economy was usually in the cities, including this little museum in Shenyang. I like that the first lesson is long live Chairman Mao. Uh, and this is in an area called Workers' Village, which was when the Northeast was the manufacturing base in the 1950s. And these were the model apartments that people could live in that had heat and telephones and running water, this socialist paradise <laughs> that they had constructed in the 50s that now look like this. You know, the whole area has been dismantled. This is a laid off factory worker who's living outside, cooking his dinner here. He's waiting for a better settlement, still wearing his work cap. 
And, you know, they kept the road names in this area. So it's really odd now when you go to this old manufacturing base, you're walking down you know, Defend Industry Boulevard, but you're looking at new condos named Napa Valley. You know, that sort of <laughs> incongruous 21st century China thing. Again, the only people I saw praising Mao were, were individuals like this in Shenyang, outside of Mao's statue, where they're actually prostrating to him, leaving him flowers, and praying for new jobs, because they had been laid off. Right? They're adhering to this older style of economy. Three more pictures, and then I'll take questions. Back in Wasteland, though, this, you know, farmers will often tell me that they've spent more years now dismantling a Marxist economy than they spent building one. And so when you see the faded propaganda on these old defunct granaries and stuff like this, you know, this is long live the Communist Party of China, it's like when we see those rusting fallout shelters, like on a post office wall, it seems like such a, a relic of such a long ago time already, although it's only been a few decades now. Also in the village, you do still see some of this old propaganda, like agriculture studies Dajai. Dajai was the big commune of the early 1970s that was sort of the model farm for China. But in Wasteland now, you know, Wasteland has become the new model farm. And so in our village, there's a brand new entrance gate here. You'll notice Eastern Fortune Rice has branded the gate themselves because they paid for it. Eastern Fortune Rice, right where this copse of trees is here, has built a hot spring resort that has attracted urbanites on the weekends to come from Changchun and Jilin. It's a Japanese <laughs> style hot spring resort. They modeled it after that. There's a little organic model farm where kids can pick watermelons and strawberries. And I would say to the locals, like, you'll never go to the hot spring, right? Like, no, it's $20 to enter. You know, it's an enormous price for them. But I said, well, what do you think about this? And they said, it's good. Like, we used to be a dead end in the middle of nowhere, and now tourists actually come to our village, and national leaders come to see us. But the thing they want more than anything, and here's the last slide I'll show you, is they want a voice in these changes. And this is a, an echo across both of these books. Urban Chinese would often say to me, whose city is this? Who's making the decisions about our neighborhood and how we live our lives? And in the countryside, too, I hear this all the time, that we don't mind modernity, we don't mind progress, we don't mind efficient, safe farming, but we want a say in what's going on here. And I'm ending on this note because this is Mr. Guan, my roommate. His family decided to contract their land to Eastern Fortune Rice. And so this is the last harvest they did as a family. They cut their rice by hand, they dried it on the road, um, traditionally as opposed to giving it to an automatic dryer or polisher. And my house that I lived in was torn down. I find it very ironic that my old Beijing house that I thought was going to be torn down still stands. Mm -hmm. But my uh, farmhouse in Wasteland has been torn down, replanted with rice. So the cycle you know, is starting again. And the Guans have moved into the new apartments, whereas Sanjo, the elderly farmer I showed you in the beginning, is still holding out. He's still saying, no, I don't want to sign my crop over to the company. So this narrative is ongoing, but I think it's one we're going to hear played out and see played out in rural China for the next 20 to 30 years. I'll end there. Thank you.